Good afternoon, and welcome to the FBI Recovery Toolkit webinar. We are glad that you can join us this afternoon. My name is Marissa Segundo, and I am with Resource Recycling Systems, or RRS, and I'll be moder moderating this session with Lynn Dyer from the Food Service Packaging Institute and Jeff Clark from the, um, he, the Director of Conserve the, with the uh, National Restaurant Association. Before we get started, we have a couple of housekeeping items. You have probably noticed that you can hear us, but we cannot hear the attendees, So, if you, but we would like to hear from you. So if you have a question throughout the webinar, you'll see the arrow pointing to a panel where you can include questions for the presenters, and we'll be answering those throughout the presentation. We'll also have a great Q&A session at the end of the webinar, so if, you, if we didn't cover anything um, and you had an additional question, you could include it at the end. We will have a recording session of the webinar available on the recovery website, which is recyclefsp.org. That's recycle, F like in food, S like in service, P like in packaging.org. So this gives you a little bit of an overview of what we'll see today during the, um, the webinar. And it's my pleasure to introduce Lynn Dyer, President of the Food Service Packaging Institute, and Jeff Clark, the Conserve Program Director for the National Restaurant Association. Lynn? Uh, thank you very much, Marissa. I really appreciate it. Um, appreciate everybody on the phone. Uh, we've got we've got about almost 100 people registered, so we're, we're really pleased with the turnout and the interest from everybody on, on this webinar. Just a few words about the Food Service Packaging Institute for those of you who may not be familiar with us. We are the trade association um, that uh, represents the folks in North America that uh, produces food service packaging. So we're talking about cups, plates, cutlery, that sort of thing. Those front of house packaging items that you find at food service establishments. We've been around since 1933, so we're over 80 plus years old, which is nice to say. Um, and then again, from a membership standpoint, just to give you an idea, we do represent a very broad portion of the industry. Um, that includes roughly about 85% of the entire industry. That's the raw material suppliers, the people that make the paperboard or the resin, um, the folks that actually make the machinery that convert the products, the converters of the packaging items themselves, um, and then we actually offer a free membership to food service distributors and operators. So if you happen to be a food service distributor or operator on the phone today um, and you're interested in learning more about FPI, don't hesitate to contact me because it's for free. Of course, those of you who are um, suppliers and uh, converters are con free to contact me as well, but membership isn't free for you, unfortunately. So um, if we go to the next slide, to give you a little bit of overview on FPI's recovery work, um, we, want to, we don't want to spend too much uh, time on this, but just wanted to point out to you that FPI does have three special interest groups within the association, the Paper Recovery Alliance and the Plastics Recovery Group. Those two groups were formed in 2011, 2012, really um, recognizing that there is valuable material, uh, valuable resources when we take things like paper and plastic food service packaging and, and put them into a landfill instead of recycling them or composting them. There are better options out there, and we're trying to find the highest and best use for those items. Um, I will say that we are uh, neutral in terms of the recovery options. That's why we use the term recovery. So I mentioned recycling and composting, but certainly energy recovery is another option as well. We have a third group called the Foam Recycling Coalition, and that group was formed in 2000. 14, if I remember correctly, and that group was formed, um, has some slightly different um, methodologies and direction for the group, and one of the things that makes them different is they're actually providing grants um, to cities and to material recovery facilities that are interested in recycling foam polystyrene. So we're going to focus um, a lot more on the, on the paper and plastic side, but certainly happy to address any questions that folks might have. Um, specifically on, on the foam side. So um, with that, if we go to the next slide, um, this just gives you an idea of the members of the PRA and the PRG. Um, sorry, we do tend to throw out a lot of acronyms, but earlier we mentioned that's the Paper Recovery Alliance and the Plastics Recovery Group. What you'll notice within those two groups is that we really have the entire food service 
packaging supply chain, all the way from that raw material supplier through to the operator. And we're very thankful to those companies that have been um, contributing special funds um, to make sure that, that we can get this, um, that these efforts underway. So if we go um, to the next slide, this is what we really are here to talk about, and that's the Food Service Packaging Recovery Toolkit. You know, we have spent quite a bit of time since we started this project back in 2011 really trying to understand the barriers, um, whether they're real or perceived, to getting more of our products recycled or composted. Um, in doing so, the approach that we've taken is a really uh, what we're calling a MRF to market approach because we need to understand, and, and we do understand, that there are crucial pieces of the puzzle here to get this successfully recovered. You know, we're going to need to get the food service operators to make sure that they're actually collecting the products um, in their stores. We need to make sure that the communities are accepting it curbside. We need to make sure that the material recovery facilities are able to process the materials successfully and that they're going to end up in the appropriate bales. And we need to make sure that there are end markets that are willing to buy the recovered materials. Um, on the on the end markets for the recycling side, on the composting, obviously on the composting side, you were talking about potentially um, composting or anaerobic digestion facilities. So um, that's really been the focus of what we've been doing. And um, in launching this food service packaging recovery toolkit about a month ago, some of this information, um, for those of you who have been following this closely, we actually had some of this information on FPI's old website, but we really wanted a standalone site to present a lot of the information that we've learned since 2011. And um, what you see is this really does kind of follows that whole flow of the food service packaging from the, both the creation of it, the use of it in the food service operations, all the way through to um, the ultimate end recovery. Um, I am delighted to say that since we launched this specific site a month ago, we've already had um, over 3,000 views from folks, um, which is really exciting. It's interesting to note that about 75% uh, of those views have been from the United States, and a quarter of them have been from outside the United States. Um, this is really hot in Denmark. I can't tell you why folks in Denmark are, are clicking on this site, but we're happy to share any of this information as we can um, with everybody. So um, when we take a look at this, um, it, interestingly enough, and, and I guess I'm not too surprised by this, but so far the, the two hottest sections of the, the site have been the Food Service Operator Toolkit and, and the End Market. So with that, let's go ahead and dive in here to the first section. So the first section is the food service operator section, and I will tell you this is brand new. Um, this entire section is completely new to this um, to us, and one of the reasons it's taken us so long to accomplish this and to put this together is because we really needed to make sure that um, that the food service operators, if they chose to recycle or compost their materials, you know, on site, that the the local material recovery facilities and the end markets were available to recycle those products. So we've been focusing a lot of our efforts in sort of the, the latter part of the work there, um, but now we've gotten to the point where we can really turn to the food service operators and say, if this is something that you're interested in doing, we really would like to make sure that, that you tackle this. Um, we do know that a lot of food service operators may be already recycling um, and composting on site. We know that typically, and Jeff, you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that uh, roughly 70% of uh, restaurants' waste is at the back of the house and 30% is the front of the house. So implementing an in-store front of house program um, is probably one of the, the later challenges that a lot of the restaurants are focusing on right now. So um, if we go to the first page here, we really just start to talk about, you know, why is this important and talking about why it's important for, for the operators themselves. Um, Jeff, maybe you could chime in and, and kind of talk about why it is for the NRA members themselves, why implementing that in-store piece is so crucial to them. Sure, absolutely. Uh, first off, before we jump into that, I just want to thank uh, FPI and Lynn's team as well as RRS for their really hard work on this. It was a significant amount of effort and uh, resources and time to pull this together, and they did a fantastic job. So uh, if you can shoot an email, say thank you for doing this for the industry, uh, that'd be fantastic. And we do really appreciate all the hard work you guys have put in. So with that note, um, yeah, it's actually really a money-saving opportunity and outward-facing branding opportunity for restaurateurs. So working with uh, restaurants who have implemented this, you know, you kind of want to start probably with some cardboard recycling, uh, which would be back of the house efforts, as Lynn mentioned. That can account for about 25% of your uh, your trash, of everything that's picked up every week. 
So really, once you get that going, uh, you can start looking at, okay, what's the next step? And I think front of the house, you know, if you really do it right, like we lay out here, uh, you can save, you know, hundreds of dollars a month. One operator in Atlanta uh, did save about $200 a month after initiating uh, some back of the house and front of the house recycling. Uh, another one in Atlanta cut their waste by 70%. So these are significant numbers and do add up over time. And uh, it can really save money and you're reducing uh, resource waste. So it's all around a uh, fantastic thing to do. Thank you very much, Jeff. So one of the things that, one of the pieces that we put into the, um, the toolkit here specifically for operators is what we're starting to see is more and more local um, or state legislation that are actually requiring that food service operators recycle or compost um, on site or um, not site, on site, but they're having to do that um, in their stores. So if you go to the next slide, one of the things that we've developed is actually a map um, that points out specific um, policies that are really related to recycling and composting specifically for food service operators. So what you do is you go onto the site and then you can look to see what's of, um, of interest in, in your location. And what you'll do is if you click on one of those buttons, what you'll be able to find is kind of a, a high-level synopsis of the legislation and then also a link to more detailed information. So typically what we're starting to see on the composting policies, for example, um, is that it might affect um, different types of operators um, based on how, many, how much organics they actually um, produce. So you'd want to take a look at each one to figure out if, you're, um, if it's applicable to, to your operation or if it's not. I will also say that this is frankly very difficult to track and so we have put on here the ability and request from you if you see that we're missing some policies we would love it if you would please pass those along and share it to us because I think it's again if it's really hard for folks like us who are in tune with this if you're a mom and pop operator in you know Omaha or someplace wherever it happens to be you may not be keeping track of some of this stuff and we we want to be able to, to share that with you so um, Jeff, do you want to talk about um, uh, the importance of, the, of this piece to, to your members? Absolutely. So this is a, a great effort and a really fantastic map to really engage with on a monthly basis because this is coming down the pipe. Uh, no bones about it. Every week I get an email about this city council in Michigan or that effort in you know, Wisconsin looking to change policies, outlaw polystyrene, ban plastic bags, and mandate composting uh, for food donation and food waste. So you, I would really advise the industry to pay attention to this because uh, you know, we're, as an association, trying to work towards this and advising our state restaurant associations to engage, but, but there's only so much you can do. So uh, it will affect uh, waste streams and all the packaging you have to buy. I mean, DC is a great example. They outlawed polystyrene January 1st of this year, and all restaurateurs had to change to much more expensive compostable or uh, recyclable packaging. So uh, please pay attention and uh, you're at with all your restaurant locations here. Uh, thanks, Jeff. And just to be clear, the map that, that we have on this site doesn't actually track any kind of specific product bans, um, but if you do have questions about that, um, FPI is certainly happy to be a resource for you. Um, this map is really specifically on um, mandatory recycling and, and composting types of policies. So if we want to go start jumping into the um, five steps, we, we had to boil it down. As you all know, if you're trying to implement a recycling program, frankly, we call it five step, steps, but it's probably 50. Um, but we'll, we'll try to keep limit it here. So first step we have is to perform a waste audit. And, you know, this is very, very basic. And we understand that there's a lot of ways to, to nuance and massage some of these different tips based on your specific facilities. Um, but at least it should help you get started. So, Jeff, you want to talk about waste audits? Because I know you've done quite a few. Yeah. So a lot of people skip this step, and I think that's a big mistake. Um, it's kind of like planning out a menu. Yeah and sort of throw your menu together with the chef and not really plan out what you're buying for how long and how long you're going to run a special. And it can come together okay, and you can make a profit and, and sell the food you're trying to sell. But you're much, much better off sitting down, looking at your customer base, looking at what you're trying to sell, and take it through to the end of your menu development. And, and doing an audit is the same thing, except for your waste side. 
So it's really taking the time to see what you currently are doing, what can change, and understanding how much you have that's going into the trash because you can't manage what you don't measure. So that's really what this is. And you know, you can do yourself. We have a fantastic guide here. There are all kinds of other resources from EPA all the way down to maybe your local community waste hauling service or environmental uh, organization within a state. Um, or just hire somebody to do it. You know, if you have uh, the resources and are time constraint, uh, constrained, then um, definitely get someone. And often uh, waste haulers will do those for you. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, so let's move on to step two, which is talk to your waste service uh, providers and haulers. So uh, this is obviously going to be very important. Once you have a better understanding of the materials in your waste stream, you might want to take you you do want to take a look at what kind of changes you may want to make. You know, are there some items that you can be recycling instead of putting in landfill? Are there opportunities to compost the food scraps that you have? Um, so we really uh, what we've tried to do is provide a list of questions when you go and talk to your haulers. So these are the types of questions that you want to ask. Um, and then we've also tried to, um, to identify the fact that we recognize not all food service operations have control of their own um, waste stream. And then if you lease your location, um, there are some different steps you might want to take. be putting that. You know, one of the best practices is going to be making sure that you put your recycling in your trash containers in the same location. Asking a consumer to go one corner of the restaurant to dispose of one item and then a different corner of the restaurant to, to, to recycle or compost an item is just not going to be in a very effective way. Um, there are a lot of different folks that will be able to help you. Um, a lot of the bin companies themselves will be able to help you with that as well. Um, but we know that not everybody's going to have um, um, the same capabilities, and so one of the things that we tried to do was to provide some um, provide help here to create customized templates. So, um, can we go to the next one? And Jeff, maybe you can walk us through this the signage template. Sure, absolutely. So this is a really key step, and uh, like Lynn said, you really work with your bin providers on how you can display some of these things. Just a quick anecdote, um, Italy in New York and Chicago spend a lot of time working on their signage and they've come up with a really sort of elegant way that fits within their brand to be able to tell their customers 
this is where plastic goes, this is where paper goes, this is composting. So don't minimize this step. Don't um, just slap something together. Really think about, okay, how can you take the resources you have and communicate that effectively to nudge people's behavior? And, uh, you know, Lynn, the FBI team, and RRS came up with this really easy to use, great tool to kind of get you started. And basically, it's a PowerPoint presentation. You can download it from the toolkit. You copy and paste or almost drag and drop whatever images you want that relate to your restaurant for food service packaging and put it on the, uh, the poster. And then just send it off to any printer. They will print it up whatever size you need it to be. I would recommend also having one in the back of the house for your employees, hung up someplace that they can see every day, maybe near a point of sale system. And that's just a reminder that, hey, you guys are also the ambassadors of our recycling and composting program, and you need to, you know, work with us to make sure everything goes in the right place. And, you know, everyone, everyone gets contamination, so you just try to work around that and work with your employees and your customers to keep nudging them, keep moving forward, and eventually everybody gets it. So uh, this is a great resource. Please uh, play around with it, and uh, we're always happy to take recommendations on uh, improvements. And uh, it's a very important step, so please don't skip this one either. Thanks, Jeff. And the other thing I would also point out on this slide is we've, we've included a, a number of just generic looking items, um, some su suggested text. We would strongly encourage you to, if you have images of packaging that's used specifically in your operation, I think that's very helpful for your customers um, to see those specific items. So if you can do that, that would be great. The other thing that Jeff really talked about is educating your team, which is actually the next step. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, one of the things we want to do is make sure, as Jeff said, it's not only about educating the, cu the customer, um, but it's also making sure that you're educating your team. And um, it's critical because they're the ones that are going to be in front with the customers, and you need to make sure they're the ones that are, that are helping with this. The other thing, too, is that you might get some really great ideas from your own teammates um, that really should, that can help you um, meet some of these sustainability goals. here you know they they're interested in it and they want to do it and sometimes management is like well it doesn't make sense here we don't have the infrastructure you know fair enough you can't do composting if there's no place to compost but the employees do want it especially the Millennials and uh, I can anyone who's interested in any facts and resources and statistics on that I'm happy to send them out uh, a bunch of research that we've done demonstrating this so to keep your employees happy try recycling try composting uh, set up your green team, and, um, you know, it's incremental steps. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, so um, if we move to the next, um, the next uh, and final step is promoting your program. So we've just taken like 20 minutes to run through something that's going to probably take you several months to do, but at the very end, you're feeling really good about everything that you've implemented in your, in your operations. Make sure you're promoting your program. Um, you know, as I'm sure Jeff can talk about, and I'll let him talk in just a minute about, you know, people are looking for this. People are looking for restaurants that are, um, are um, implementing sustainability practices, that are implementing recycling and composting programs. So, you know, things like make sure that people know about it on your website, social media. You know, we talk about you sharing it, but hey, share your news with us. I will tell you from FPI standpoint, we would love to promote um, food service operators that are doing um, front of house 
uh, recycling and composting. So we would love to hear about that. So please feel free to, to share that information with us. And, and I'm sure Jeff would say the same thing. Um, Jeff, anything on promotion there? Yeah, just a lot of restaurateurs, unfortunately, um, are, don't promote what they're doing enough. I think they're very, uh, you know, sometimes rightfully so, a little nervous about getting what they're doing out there. Uh, but it's such a hot topic right now. And as long as you are actually doing it and you're not greenwashing, putting their money where their mouth is and uh, where their values lie. And so you need to let your customers know, I'm doing this. I'm aligning with your values. We're taking these steps. And so Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, those are all wonderful, easy, low-cost entry efforts that you can do to promote your sustainability programs. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Um, we, before we jump out of the food service operators section of the toolkit, are there any questions? Uh, Marissa, maybe you can let me know if there are any questions that are coming in specifically to this section of the site. Not hearing any. We're going to just continue to move on then. So uh, the next section of the site is specifically geared towards communities. Uh, you know, one of the things that we have been focusing on, I mentioned earlier, and I mentioned the statistics that um, uh, within a typical quick service restaurant, 70% um, of the waste is back of the house, 30% is front of the house. Another interesting statistic is that roughly 75% of all menu items from a, from a quick service restaurant or a fast casual restaurant actually leaves the store through delivery or um, takeout, carry out, whatever it happens to be the drive-through. And so one of the initial projects that we did early on is really to try to understand where all the material is because if you want to recover it, you need to know where to collect it. And what we learned was that um, actually back at the um, individual homes, that's where the largest portion uh, or lo largest volume of food service packaging is available for recovery. Um, and I, I will tell you initially we were a little surprised by that, but if you think about the fact that so many people get their items to go, they might consume something in their car and then leave the packaging in the car and then ultimately not actually dispose of it until they get home. So we've been focusing so much um, of our efforts specifically on that residential curbside, and that's where the communities really come in. So if we go to the next slide, what we see here is some community or some resources specifically geared towards communities. Um, and some of these we've been developing over the last couple of years. And um, you'll see as we move forward through the different, um, um, the different stakeholders in this whole process, it's really trying to tailor the resources to the specific um, stakeholder groups. And so in this case, what you'll find here is you'll find things like an information sheet on food service packaging. Um, we actually did some benchmarking study to understand um, who's actually accepting food service packaging from the MRFs. Um, we're going to get to that in a minute. We're actually in the process right now of working with the Sustainable Packaging Coalition and other organizations on, on understanding um, better what the number of communities in the United States that are actually already accepting food service packaging. And, and to be honest with you, um, there are quite a few communities that are already successfully recovering food service packaging. Um, and, and on this page, you'll see examples. Um, Seattle, Washington, and Boise, Idaho, for example, you can read about how they're successfully doing that. Um, another uh, concern that we hear from communities uh, and from others is about things like food residue. You know, they're concerned that if they add food service packaging to a curbside recycling program, that it's going to mean that they're going to have a lot more food in it. Um, in fact, what we did was we did two different studies, one in Delaware and one in Boston, and the results of those studies you'll actually find in that section there. And uh, a hint for you, actually it turns out that food service packaging is no more contaminated than your other commonly recycled food packaging items. So if we go to the next slide, please. The next group is going to be those material recovery facilities. Obviously, once they're collected, they're going to be taken to a material recovery facility to be processed before moving on to the end market. So let's talk a little bit about those food or the material recovery facilities or the MRFs. Uh, so, you know, again, here we start seeing, again, additional case studies on MRFs that are successfully recovering food service packaging and providing some similar information that we're providing to the communities. 
Uh, we're also trying to provide some, some high-level data because we know that's going to be important. Um, you know, food service packaging is, uh, is a crucial part of, of everybody's lives. If you get your coffee to go, if you get your, your, your lunch um, from, from the local cafeteria or wherever it happens to be. And so people often think about food service packaging in terms of, you know, tons and tons and tons and tons, and that it is a very large portion of the waste stream, when in fact it's really not. If you go back and you take a look at EPA data, year after year, food service packaging is less than 2% of the municipal poly waste stream. But um, we, when we're talking to communities and material recovery facilities and end markets, they need to see what kind of numbers are we talking about. So we actually try to pull out some, some high level information so that you understand, you know, like here it says 200, in a city of 250,000, you're talking about 3,000 tons of food service packaging annually. So um, this is the, the type of information that we think the MRFs are going to be most interested in. So if you want to go to the next slide. Um, also on this section um, is high-level high details from a material flow study that we actually did with a few different organizations, the American Chemistry Council, the Association of Plastics Recyclers Carton Council, and the National Association of PET Container Resources. And um, in that study, we actually got together to understand and better understand what happens to, in our case, food service packaging when it's in a, in a MRF. You know, is it going to flow to the appropriate bales? And if you click on that link there, you're going to find those, that high-level information. So, um, and if we go to the, the next slide, let's start talking about, um, we talked about the flow, but then what happens in those end markets? Um, you know, this is really critical for us, and we've been spending quite a bit of time specifically on the end markets because we know that if there's no place for the material to go, if the end markets don't want the material, that's really the critical piece. We need to make sure that there's demand for our products. And so this section is really geared specifically for those end markets, um, both on, in terms of paper and plastic. And we've tried to provide, again, some high-level information for you, the types of materials and bales that you can find. Um, from the very beginning, we have said we are not advocating for a food service packaging only bale, only because the volumes are so, so very small. You know, I mentioned that 2% of municipal solid waste. So we've really been looking at what are the existing bales where our products might actually find a home. And so here you find some more information about where some of the materials that food service packaging products are made from, what types of bales they might end up actually going into. And in fact, what we're finding um, is that there are a number of end markets, again, that are already successfully pointing this out. So on this page, you'll find a couple of different case studies, one up in Canada and one down in California. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, some of the resources that you'll find on here. Um, the one on the on the top there, existing bales. I, I just mentioned that we were looking at how do we put food service packaging into an existing bale. So one of the potential bales that we're looking at, um, just to give you an example, is a mixed paper bale. Um, if, if you're looking at a typical mixed paper bale, if you were to see recovery of food service packaging at about a 10% recovery rate, which is frankly, you know, a good a good estimate when you're starting with a new product, um, introducing a new product. Um, food service packaging would actually make up only 3% of that mixed paper bale. And interestingly enough, when we talk to the, to the, to the paper mills, and we're doing that quite a bit, um, you know, we know that one of the concerns that the mills might have would be the poly coating on a paper food service package. Um, when we do these bale estimates, what we realize is that actually a poly, the poly coated materials would only be about 1% of, uh, of that mixed paper bale. Um, on the coatings, while we're just talking about it, it's interesting because there are so many changes going on in the food service packaging industry, as well as the, the broader packaging industry. There's a lot of R&D going in. Um, you know, a lot of folks throughout the entire supply chain are really thinking more about the recyclability and compostability of products, and there's a lot of R&D going into that space. So while we know there is a whole host of work going in on, for example, the coating side for paper, um, we have to solve for today's material types. And so we are looking to solve for today's poly-coated materials, but in 5, 10, 15 years, we may have a completely different product that we're going to be solving for um, and looking for. Um, so the other thing that I would point out to for, on, for you on the end markets page, and it's pretty exciting, and again, we visually it's always a, a good thing to have, is this map at the bottom uh, map at the bottom of the page. And I think if we go to the next slide, you can see it. Um, if you're looking specifically for an end market for paper or plastic food service packaging, you can go in here and you can click on the different links 
and give you details on where potential end markets might be for those food service packaging products. And it's going to be uh, really identified more towards um, the bale type. So, for example, you know, does it accept a PET bottle bale? In some cases, they're going to accept thermoforms. In other cases, they're not. So we're obviously, for our standpoint, focusing on those that might accept the thermoforms as well, um, or the, the all-rigid, pre-picked, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a really good resource, um, certainly for end markets, for MRFs, for communities. You'll see that there's a lot of um, crossover between the sections because, in many cases, people are looking for similar information. So um, if you want to go to the next slide, please. So um, I am happy to say that when we launched this um, site a month ago, we hadn't quite finished the composting and anaerobic digestion facility section. We literally just uploaded it today. Um, I understand from, um, from our team at RRS, there were a lot of clicks on this section, and we just had a coming soon. So I'm pleased that we have actually uploaded it. So if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see just kind of uh, some highlights from it. And really what we've tried to do is take a look at it in terms of there's a growing number of, certainly growing interest in food scrap recovery. And along with that, there may be some opportunities there for the packaging itself too. And so what we've really tried to do is really talk about, uh, uh, from a high level standpoint, opportunities um, for these products within these types of facilities. Um, and then also start diving down into the types of questions that if you're a composter considering accepting food service packaging, um, trying to answer some of the questions that they might have, things like, you know, what types of uh, food service packaging products might be good candidates, what types of composters might be good candidates to accept these materials, what types of steps that composters and communities might want to take um, when implementing a program that includes um, compostable food service packaging. Um, another area that we felt it important to add in here is AD facilities, anaerobic digestion facilities. We're starting to see more of these facilities, and in some cases these are accepting packaging, so we wanted to try to address the types of questions that um, folks might have. So um, I would encourage you to take a look at those. Those are, again, brand new sections that were just added today. Um, I would also add that one section that we have not talked about and we're not going to today, but I would invite you to, to, um, to take a look at um, along the top line all the way to the right, we have an FAQ section for just kind of very general questions that we tend to get um, pretty most often related to recycling and or composting of food service packaging. So that's there as well. So um, with that, let's go to the next slide. And I just wanted to point out to everybody that while we just updated this about a month ago, um, this is definitely a living website. We plan to be updating it with, with new case studies, with new resources as they come up. We, want, we will certainly be updating all the maps that you're seeing. And, um, you know, we are looking to you. So come and tell us, you know, are there questions that you have? You know, if we get a question often enough from enough people, we know that that's something that's going to be of interest to a lot of different folks and we may want to add that to, to the recovery toolkit. So um, definitely it's a living, breathing document, um, and it will certainly be updated as we go along. So with that, I'll turn it over to a Q&A portion, um, and wanted to open it up and see if anybody had any specific questions for us. Um, I will give you guys an opportunity to, to type those in at this point. Uh, Marissa, do you have any for us right now? Um, I don't see any, and I just want to, once again, draw everyone's attention to that side panel bar that says questions, and you can add, add any question to, to Jeff or Lynn, and we'll take care of, we'll answer those now. We've got um, quite a bit of time left. I talk fast, so that's why we have a lot of time left. You're very efficient. <laughs> <laughs> I know one of the questions, Lynn, that I get a lot um, from people that are starting a new recycling program is what is the best way to start the communication um, if you're a restaurant um, with who's the best point of contact um, to get a, a program started? Is it with the city? Is it with the MRF directly? What, what has been your best practices? And that can go to Jeff too, either one. I would say let's start with Jeff since restaurants are his area of expertise. Sure. I would, um, you know, start with your current hauler and just ask them, you know, do you supply recycling services? Do you, you know, is composting available? Um, and see what they say. And, you know, it's an open market. So if you feel like they're not doing you service, a good, they're giving you good service, then you can go to somebody else. 
Um, next, I'd say definitely check out the municipality. There's often uh, great starter kits or um, you know ways to engage the community and working with uh, local organizations. And then also uh, talk to your other restaurateurs in and around your area because if they're already recycling and they have recommendations on, oh, I started with this person and it didn't work out, so we switched to this one, or you know, oh, you know, some other tips or things like that. That's really the kind of the best way um, to really understand your local market because, as we all know, recycling and composting is an extremely local endeavor. Absolutely, good advice. Do you have anything to add to that, Lynn? And I see yeah, I think he did. He, he hit all the topics I would have. Thank you. Excellent. I see we've got a, a couple more questions coming in, so keep them keep them coming. Um, this one says, "Could to go food or clamshells made of foams, polystyrene? Um, are they recyclable?" So, um, are they oh, recyclable? Go I'm ahead. sorry. I'm sorry. Um, the question was kind of. It, are there any efforts to reduce the amount of food service packaging um, as far as foam and things like that? So um, I can't speak to if there are efforts to reduce the amount of food service packaging made from foam. I will tell you we represent all of the different manufacturers and, and we certainly support the use of all of those different items. What I would say is there is increased recycling of those products. Um, you know, whether you're talking about paper products, plastic products, foam products, there are perceptions out in the marketplace that you can't recycle certain items. We don't know why that's the case. In some cases we do, but you know, often um, it, it, it's old information. And I will give you an example of the pizza box. The pizza box is one of those questions that people often argue about, you know, can you recycle a pizza box, can you not? And uh, actually that was interesting enough that we went back and did some research and we reached out to the OCC markets and we talked to, the, to them about whether they're willing to recycle pizza boxes and the vast majority of those OCC markets said, absolutely, there's no problem. So for whatever reason, there's a perception that you to put together, um, a, spending time and money to actually provide grants. Last year we gave two different grants out, um, each um, roughly $50,000 to, to communities that were interested. One was Alpine Waste in Denver, um, and then another one was um, Colchester County in Nova Scotia, Canada. Um, and actually the grant program just um, closed its doors for 2016, so we'll be announcing additional grants. Um, and for those of you who are interested, um, and again, going back to the discussion about is it really recyclable or not, are people actually doing it, there was, and I don't have the link in front of me, but I can get it, it's certainly on the, recycle. if you go to recyclefoam.org, um, which is another one of our sites, um, you can find a link to a map that was created um, thanks to funding from the American Chemistry Council that actually shows the dozens and dozens and dozens of cities in the U.S. and Canada that are recycling foam, both curbside and in drop-off programs. Thank you. Next question. Um, there is a question. Uh, well, that is a question I feel it can be. Uh, someone wanted to know it's a um, 3,000 tons of food service packaging and population. Uh, I guess that was an example on the um, on the website. It says 3,000 tons of food service packaging and a population of um, 250,000 people. A city results in. 300 tons of recoverable material, asking if that was a mistype. I think that is, I think that's correct. The, three, the yeah, 300, the, go ahead. Here's the, here, here's the thing, you know, um, we're, we're really starting off um, in some cases with recycling some of these items. Some items are more, are being recycled more than others at this point. 
So we're looking to achieve something like a 10% recovery, you know, in the near future. If you think about something like PET bottles, newspapers, some of these groups or some of these items that have been around for decades, um, they've, it's taken them 30, 40, 50 years to get to the recovery rates that they are right now. So that would be why we go from 3,000 to 300. So it's that 10% recovery rate that, where that comes from, if that makes sense. Yes, and also um, I would imagine too the weight of food service packaging would have something to do with, with that as well. Is that, yeah. would you agree? Yeah, and it's interesting because that's going to um, that's going to split things too. Because um, typically, what we find is that the paper products are actually heavier than the than the plastic products. So if you talk about in terms of units, it's pretty evenly split between paper and plastic. Uh, but be, when it comes to weight, um, it's roughly two thirds paper and one third plastic. Mm -hmm. And that's I, and I'm sure uh, Jeff could speak to this too, as far as in a restaurant situation you may not have as heavy of items, but those are taking up a lot of, of dumpster, expensive dumpster space as well. Correct. Um, I think one of the things we've sort of seen a, a little bit of a perverse consequence of some bans um, for restaurants is, okay, we're banning foam, we're banning something like that, something else, and then restaurateurs then have to buy much more expensive uh, compostable materials, but if there's no composting resources nearby, or there's no infrastructure to take the composting, it just goes in the landfill. So it's actually environmentally worse and more expensive to take a compostable food service packaging clamshell, for example, and put it in the landfill than taking a polystyrene one and putting it in the landfill. Because as Lynn mentioned, polystyrene is mostly air. Um, so yeah, it's taking up a lot more space often, it's heavier, and uh, it costs a lot more money both on the front end and the back end to uh, dispose of. Thank you. If you don't have the composting resources available. Right, right. And that's, and that's where the toolkit is, is extremely helpful. As we've pointed out, you know, there's a lot of different resources to check and see what, what locally the resources um, that you have in your area. So that's why the toolkit is an invaluable resource. Uh, we have a question yeah, and, coming uh, in. Just as, oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Just as an example, like um, A&W Canada is doing some great stuff with rolling out composting and compostable packaging in select markets where it's available. And where it's not available, they're not doing that. <laughs> so it, it, use the resources, use the toolkit, figure out what you can do, what makes sense where, and start that way. Excellent. So we have a question and that I would, uh, is coming in. Oh, go ahead. Add, add I was just going to gonna add that's where it's really important for you to be reaching out to your local communities, to your haulers, um, to, to really find out from a local perspective. You know, from our standpoint, we would really like to see that you're recycling and composting your food service packaging at home, at work, and at play. And so um, that's where the intersection is between the food service operators, the communities, the MRFs, and the end markets. That's Sorry, no, no, that's a great point. I'm glad you added that. Um, we do have some questions that are coming in about um, composting, and I think the two can probably go together, but one is talking about um, the increase in food diversion and, and then also addressing packaging waste issues. Um, I know in some places they're mentioning how you can combine food waste and compostable-based packaging. Um, in, into one stream, and how is our FBI and NRA promoting or educating users on this option? So I, I'll go ahead and start, Jeff, and then you can jump in. Absolutely, you know, I mentioned that, that we're looking at all the different diversion opportunities, and, and, and we're active with a number of groups to make sure that the infrastructure is there, trying to figure out how you can really expand that infrastructure. We want to make sure that there are opportunities to do that. Um, so what we're finding, again, I, I mentioned earlier, there's quite a lot of attention right now on um, recovering food scraps because um, I think most people know that that's the largest portion of the municipal solid waste stream, and that's something that shouldn't be buried. You could easily be composting that or put, putting that into an AD facility. And yes, that, um, you know, also 
including composable packaging is another option as well that is going to go along with it. One of the discussion points that we've been having recently is, you know, do you actually see the additional food scraps coming in as a result of using composable packaging? And, and I unfortunately I wasn't there, but I understand there was a fantastic presentation um, from AgriCycle um, at BioCycle a couple of uh, weeks ago that really talked about some of the studies that they've done um, and really have shown that they are getting additional food scraps because of using compostable food service packaging. So definitely something, uh, a topic that is um, very much top of mind. Um, I'm going to tee up a, a point and then I'll turn it over to, um, to Jeff, but there is an entire group called the Food Waste Reduction Alliance that um, there are three different groups that are involved with it, the National Restaurant Association, Food Marketing Institute, and Grocery Manufacturers as well. Um, I will tell you that I sit on, on that group as a strategic advisor trying to provide some information from a packaging standpoint. So Jeff, maybe you could talk a little bit about that food scrap recovery and the importance for, for the restaurants and NRA as, as well. Sure, yeah, that was a great segue. Um, absolutely, we, you know, we're trying to really educate the industry further. Uh, compostable packaging together with the food scraps is often excellent, and it allows the composter to get at that really good nutrient-dense resource that is the food in the packaging. But again, reiterating Lynn's point, uh, check with your composter, because not everything can go into the compost bin, even if it says recyclable. They may have certain standards. They may only accept certain types of compostable bags. Uh, or they may have a different type of facility, not to get too wonky, but there's multiple ways to compost, you know, industrial grade composting. Uh, so you want to just make sure that you're not buying something and, and spending a lot of money that's then not going to be accepted by your composter. So it's just doing your homework and doing a little bit of research. For the uh, Food Waste Reduction Alliance, uh, that is a really good resource that uh, we're meeting together, working with different industries. So the grocers, the manufacturers of the food, and the restaurants. And right now we're really trying to get our arms around what is the amount of food waste going into landfills and what is the amount donated and what is the amount composted. And as you can imagine, the three industries are very different and they have very different drivers about what is how and how food waste is created. Uh, so we're, we're really trying to Get that. We have a survey coming out very soon. Uh, if there are any restaurateurs on the call and they'd like to fill out the survey, please send me an email. I'd be happy to, uh, to send it along. Um, and then we're also trying to uh, get information out there into the press and into restaurateurs' hands about, hey, this is a solvable problem. Let's work at it together. You know, between 25 and 40 percent of food that's grown in this country literally goes to the landfill. That's uh, on the high end the three quarters of the size of California, an irritable agricultural land. So complete waste of resources. It's a real tra tragedy, especially when there are hungry people in this country numbering in the millions. So uh, it's something that we are working all together to try to educate the industry on, uh, but it's a complex issue. So uh, we're moving forward as we can. That's great. We do have a question. Complex issues. Oh, go ahead, Lynn, sorry. I just said we love complex issues because all of this is, whether it's food recovery or um, making sure that you're recovering more food service packaging, they're all very complex issues that are going to involve a lot of different stakeholders and that's really why you know, we created that toolkit is to try to involve all the, the relevant stakeholders in this whole process. Sorry, go ahead. And that's a really good point. Um, we had a, a, on the line of composting, um, we had a question about um, do you all promote the use of bio bins which compress or pre-compost some of this organic and paper waste prior to sending them for composting? That's an interesting I can jump on this, Lynn, if you, Go if ahead. you don't want to. Right on ahead. Um, I, we, ha we are not currently promoting any of any company developing any of those. Um, we've looked at a number of them. The research is still not set on uh, is it in a life cycle cost analysis, is it better, is it worse? Um, I think it's an individual decision by the restaurant owner whether or not it makes sense for them, whether they have the room and the funding to be able to purchase one of these machines because they can often be quite expensive in the tens of thousands of dollars. Um, 
so we're not recommending at this time any particular uh, technology methodology uh, to do that. There are some promising cases, but um, we're uh, just not quite there yet. We have some. We have several people from the public sector on this call that are interested in trying to get some of this food service packaging items recycled in their communities. Um, can you? And I know um, Jeff. Too, I'm sure both of you have great examples of good partnerships that have happened. Um, so between um, the public sector recycling education uh, representative and uh, the business sector or you know either from a retail side or from a restaurant side trying to um, bring their pool their resources to work together to get this stuff out of the landfill so so I'll take that first and certainly we're seeing that you know really across the board we're hoping to work with a number of different folks we will be working directly with cities and counties um, in actually this year and moving forward in, in providing the resources that they may need to add paper and plastic food service packaging. So we're going to be doing that on our own, but we're also going to be doing that in concert with groups like uh, the Recycling Partnership. Uh, we're a very proud member uh, and a board member of the Recycling Partnership. And, you know, we're really looking to leverage um, groups like the Recycling Partnership that are already doing that outreach to the public communities to work with them um, both on recycling their food service packaging, but also broader um, other types of packaging as well. So um, I, I think there's already a number of different examples of that going on, both individually within FPI, um, with our member companies maybe perhaps doing some of that on their own, as well as FPI partnering with other different groups as well. Jeff, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, I'd agree. I think um, one of the biggest pieces we've seen, especially on recycling and the food waste, food donation issue, is partnering with universities. They have a volunteer force of young, passionate students, and they're often willing to you know, get dirty and get out there and donate food and, and transport food. Um, and so you can tie in food service packaging with that and recycling. So from a restaurateur perspective, I think it makes sense uh, if you have the time and once you sort of establish yourself to reach out to a university or if you have a presence in a university to, you know, begin engaging some of the students because they're your customers and they're, you know, again, um, younger, millennials, focused on the environment and spend money where their values lie. Uh, and that ties right in, you know, not to be cynical, but ties right into your mind. So really looking at uh, a lot of, I mean, just pick any large city, there's a university involved with the, the public sector uh, as well as businesses to come together and uh, recycle, compost, donate food, and, uh, you know, minimize, you know, and even in the zero waste movement, uh, minimize the waste as much as possible. Um, and they're very successful at it. So I would also just um, just say it's, it's interesting to note because I mentioned we've been working at this since 2011, and I can think back to our first webinar that we had, which was probably in 2012, maybe 2013, and I thought I think about the attendees that we were having in those early early days. Probably the vast majority were the packaging folks. They just wanted to listen to hear what we had to say, but we didn't have a whole lot from the public sector. When I take a look at the registration list, because yeah, we do keep track of who's going to who's registering for these calls. You know, probably 50% of the calls or the registrants from today are from cities, counties, and states um, that are interested in recycling or composting food service packaging. So we know there's growing interest from that from that sector. And um, you know, if you're part of that very important state. If your questions aren't being asked or answered by the toolkit, please do reach out to us because we would love to help you um, make sure that you're adding paper and plastic food service packaging products to, to, to your program. Thank you. We, I think we have time for just one more question. And one came in, you had mentioned um, the uh, pizza boxes earlier. And um, the question was around kind of standard myths and, and facts of um, of pizza box recycling, but I think summarizing it, what do you feel like is the best messaging either in a municipal um, program or what have you for dealing with pizza boxes in recycling? So I think it depends on whether the program has just recycling or if it has recycling and composting because then I think that, you know, there are certain items that can be recycled or composted and that's 
frankly a good problem to have um, when you have multiple options to divert that valuable material. So I think you have to look to see what your local circumstances are. Um, we know from a from the paper industry that they do not want food contaminated um, materials. Um, certainly, an entire pizza in a pizza box they don't want. But if you know there's a tiny little bit of uh, of grease, they're probably okay with that. What they're not okay with is that little plastic table that somebody might put in there, or that um, that that foil liner. So you know, I would think you look at um, the types of messaging that you want to provide to the consumers. Things like you know, rinse and recycle, or empty and recycle, to make sure that the end markets are going to get what they're looking for. So um, that's something that we're working on this year is that consumer messaging specifically to food service packaging. So. Stay tuned on that one, and we'll certainly be working with, with, with folks like the Recycling Partnership and Sustainable Packaging Coalition, ASNPA, the American Forest and Paper Association as well, um, to make sure we're getting those, um, those messages right. So, all right, Marissa, I see 3 o'clock, and I, I know people's time are, is valuable, so um, let's wrap it up, perhaps. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much, Lynn, uh, Lynn Dyer from the Food Service Packaging Institute, and Jeff Clark the National Director of Conserve a National Restaurant Association. Um, thank you all for your time. I would like to point out that several people did write in with um, to thank you both for your time and your expertise and, um, in this webinar. Uh, we will be sending out a, uh, a recap and the, um, with the contact information for the two presenters um, because I don't see that that slide was on there. So we'll go ahead and send an email to those who registered with the, um, the contact information. But you can see um, a copy of this on recyclefsp.org. So please go to that site often. And thank you all so much for your time. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Great job.